Good morning. Good to see you all. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah, I appreciate um, everything I've heard so far. It's been very encouraging. Um, just want to be thankful for all that. And yeah, remember to number our days and to be very mindful of that. Um, another aspect of numbering or just remembering the days is kind of how the weeks flow and, and we get to this day and we call it the Lord's Day and I think it's, it's a special day and in that way we can, we can uh, observe and remember just how this is the day um, that we can count as the Lord's Day as in the day He resurrected and the day He he um, showed himself to the world, you know, who, who he, who he um, is in fullness. Okay, well, why don't we stand for a prayer before we go into the message. <clears throat> oh God, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for a good day, countless blessings, just for showing us your love, and all the good things, goodness and mercies that come from you. Surely those will follow us all the days of our life. And we just know and trust that in you and of you is all the fullness of the Godhead in a body. And, and we believe in that. We put our faith in that. And help us now to learn of you, to be sobered by your words. Um, to be ever watchful and waiting with 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 eagerness, uh, your your coming. Bless everyone here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I want to start with with uh, reading some passages from from the Gospels. Um, and I think my, as I was putting this together, <clears throat> what my mind often went to is that I, I think I have a, my, my thoughts are kind of a, a sobering message of hope, is what, what I call it. Just, you know, this sobering life of warfare that we're in, um, very vividly displayed by Jesus, what he faced, what he told us we'll face. And then the, just the hope, like the, the fact that, that he rose and that we can rise, these are things of hope. But, but just to know that, that there is a way, though, to go through that, that's really, really um, described in the gospel. And um, if we understand the gospel in that way, um, it's good news. Like It's just the good news portrayed in these four different... Um, records, you know, writings, and they have lots of similarities, and they have um, lots of ways that just make them look very real. Just how they're, they have some differences, yet they are easily compiled. And one of the things that's easily um, easily found throughout all four not not everything is found through all four. Um, is is what what we read in Matthew. Um, I read in Matthew ten, verse thirty eight. <clears throat> it says, "He that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it." And I'm not sure. I might come back to that with some thoughts, but I just want to capture the verses relating to that. Um, and we have another one in Matthew 16. Um, verse 25, it says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Um, and then we have the similar, very similar thing in Mark 8. I'm, I'm leaving my fingers in this so I can get back to it. 
Mark 8. This one will read a little more in a complete manner. Starting in verse um, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke, saying openly. And he spoke that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. And when he had called the people unto him with his, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow after me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And now we'll go to the one in Luke. Um, Luke 9 is very similar. Let's go to Luke 14. Um, same kind of same type of message, but but a bit different. Twenty five says, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. <coughs> and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it, lest haply after he found, laid the foundation is not able to finish it? All that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king goeth to war against another, sits not down first and consoleth with, consoleth whether, he be able with 10,000 to meet them that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else what other, what the other is, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. And then John chapter 12. He that loves his, lo loves his life shall lose it. He that hates his life in this world shall keep it until life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So, what all is in connection with these passages? You got uh, the ones in Matthew, the connection with with these sayings of taking up our cross and follow after him and being worthy um, are things like being willing to confess him. The, the difference between confessing him or, or being ashamed and denying him. Or another one is um, in Matthew 16 would be the one where if we're not willing, like if we're not willing to, to um, what it, it uses the word hate, um, in a in a quite strong way, in a quite quite a strong manner, um, if we're not willing to hate everything, even down to our own life, we're we're just not we're not worthy of him. And it seems like that's the thing 
That's the thing that Peter was struggling with. I can easily understand. Like, um, here's a young guy that, you know, he's following after Jesus. He's made a commitment. But then the harder things of following Jesus come into play, where Jesus is talking about the fact that he's going to enter Jerusalem. He's going to be, he's going to be scourged. He's going to be, um, he's going to suffer many things by the elders and the chief priests and. Um, those were the things that Peter just hadn't counted the cost of that. Um, you know, he, he um, somehow just thought this couldn't be, and, and he had that to learn yet. And so we're of that same nature. We're of that same... We kind of have an advantage looking back on that, having the bigger picture. And it's just, I want to go to the end of John. I think I have notes for that. Uh, where, where John, and John, it, it just, like there when, when the call was to follow me, um, see if I have that right, it's again Peter and Jesus, and Peter is, is still struggling with this same thought about, oh, like, what about the other guy? And, Jesus again just brings it back to, to, to Peter and says, follow me. Um, and it would seem to me like at, by, this, by this point, taking up the cross and following after Jesus would have, Peter would have had the bigger picture. Um, beforehand, what was probably commonly known about taking up a cross was done to Roman criminals. This was done with capital punishment to um, people that were totally wicked. And it was a known thing that once you're on a cross, you know, that's the ultimate of punishment. And here was Jesus claiming that he's going to end up on a cross. And of course, it uh, makes sense how that Peter wouldn't, wouldn't have understanding of that um, at that point. My... my uh, what I can get out of that is, is just a compassion, you know, a compassion of not, full, not having a full understanding. Um, but the viewpoint that we have is just quite a viewpoint of an, of an advantage. Um, and so much more should we just know it's the right thing. It's, it's the, um, the thing we're called to do is to, is to take up our cross, follow after him. Luke says daily, daily take up our cross. That was even set pre, um, pre-crucifixion, um, which just intens- intensifies all that picture of daily being on a cross. Um, and I, th- I think Jesus thought it, it's very, very, very important to, to just come right to the, the hardest places um, of making the connection with, like, denying him, Versus confessing him, um, being being bold for him versus being ashamed of him. Those are all common things. Um, family ties were really tight. I think they still are often really tight. Um, and those are things that he called upon for us to um, like count the cost of that. That was both. You know that was both that that covers for everyone. Like you got father mother, brother, sister, they're, they're all in there like a, um, the scenario can just fit every situation when someone um, is an adult and they become a believer. We have to count those things. And so, so it, seems, it seems to me like what I get from Scripture and what I observe in the day we're in, that a lot of the, um, oh, we might say reasons, um, a lot of things that people hang on to that, that they just can't like give up are things like wealth, fame, um, power, and, the, and they're, they're, um, their desire to really impact and influence through, through their way of doing, um, through, through, through their own hand, you might say. Those are the things that that I think we have to 
we have to just know, like, we have to let go of, of those, like, those things. And in, in the cross, there is power. And this is, this is the gospel. This is the good news. Um, it's really um, a reverse from, from what a lot of, a lot of people think. Like, it's, it's upside down in a lot of ways. The one in Matthew 16, verse 25 says, For whosoever, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And I think being that I, that I was capturing a lot from those verses, that's why I think that, that what, where my thoughts go is um, like a sobering um, reality with hope. Because, you know, if we, if we just lose our lives... Um, for his sake, it has to be for the right sake. Then, then that's how the how our life is found. Like if if I have to like add a few words or make a little little bit of a um, explanation this to that, I'd say it's something like um, like giving up our life, which means um, the, like the way the natural man thinks. The natural man cannot receive the things that are spiritual. Um, and so giving up those ways is giving up your life. But then uh, just leaving it empty like that isn't, isn't finding your life either. The way to find it is also then to take up the life that asks us to, um, to do the things you know, that are hard to do. Um, you know, just, just some of the really practical things that Jesus asked some of his people there to do was if a Roman soldier asks you to go one mile, go with him too. And um, I'm sure it was already a stretch for a Jew to go a mile with a Roman soldier. Um, if I understand that right, the Roman soldier had the full right to um, just ask a Jew to drop what he's doing and bear my load. You're, look, you're my servant. Um, that's, that was the setup back in that day. And... And here Jesus didn't say that, well, you know, it's the best thing to do, or, you know, if you find it convenient, help him bear his load. He said, go, just go a second mile with it. And, um, like, that's an amazing display of, of giving up one's life. <clears throat> and we should be able to, like, articulate that day into this day somehow. It seems like there's lots of things that we could just um, convert it from how it was in that day and bring it, bring it to this, this day and put a, put a practice to it. That goes on to say in verse 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The soul is a very, like it's a very, uh, to God, it's a very, very valuable thing. It's the thing. I, I visualize it like this, but I have no idea whether it's really like it, like this or not. But I visualize it's, it being the thing that God can use to create a new man. Like the soul is this invisible thing that in, in my little mind and how I, I can just, with glimpses, and uh, so on, like, know and understand God and how he does things is like knowing that we'll be a new man in heaven. He, if we give him this soul, Psalm 63 says, my soul follows hard after thee. Um, if we follow hard after God with our soul, he can take that and make a new man out of it. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then... He shall reward every man according to his works. Um, and then let's go to First Corinthians three. I think it's a deep message in there. I appreciate the cross and how Paul understood and how he. 
told us that the cross is foolishness to the world. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Um, and that's, that's like what I want to captivate here, uh, that making the connection of the gospel being the power of God. Um, if you remember right, like, uh, Mark's gospel starts in with saying that this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, and, and the gospel and its message in its fullness, like all the teachings and then just the power displayed by Jesus and uh, willingly being crucified, um, knowing that he'll be resurrected, and he, he told the disciples all those things. He told them that in Matthew 16, he's going to suffer many things by the elders and the scribes. He's going to die, and after three days, he's going to raise, raise up. He just knew it. And um, if we are in this, in this gospel, in this, if we have applied our life to, to that gospel, we have the same hope. We can just as confidently say, you know, yeah, we're going to suffer many things. I, as far as being tried and the, the precise way of, uh, th that, those things all vary, but if we have counted the cost, we have just laid our life down for him, um, we, can, we can just say it in the same way that, you know, we have the hope of the resurrection. All right. Okay, 1 Corinthians 1, <clears throat> For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Um, I plan to read most of that chapter, but I want to stop there and just uh, just say that I think I think as much as God has done that, God has um, made foolish the wisdom of this world. I think I think in the same way we repeat that, like in that way we be, we become perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. Um, and, and the taking on, or in this case, the preaching of the cross. For, af for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. It, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Okay, that's, that's who and what he is. The power of God and the wisdom of God in a man. 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For we see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. For God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confront the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confront the things which are mighty. The base things of the world, things which are despised, God has chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are you but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made un unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And so, <clears throat> I think it's just a good exercise to like, just take some time to, to visualize this, this intense um, thing that Jesus went through that he calls his disciples to go through as well. Um, and some of his early disciples went through the exact, pretty much the exact same thing while there was still, the, the crucifixion was still capital punishment. 
they they went through the a lot of the same things. Um, a, a man being being the teacher of all teachers, and finally being betrayed by one of the the people that he that he was teaching, um, and through through that he gets betrayed. He suffers many things by the elders um, and the high council. They mock him. As soon as he gets, gives a little bit of an explanation, they like whack him on the face. Um, according to prophecy, his beard was plucked out. They spit him in the face. And they, um, they beat him. They beat him with stripes. Um, forget how many times, but that was the state of Jesus before he went on the cross. That was, that was what he would have looked like um, before, um, like before he went on the cross. And this, was, this happened throughout a time period of maybe, I don't know how long. He was tried, he was tried and then he was sent back and forth. That all took time. But within a day's, half a day's time probably, all those suffering type of things happened to him. And um, we can only imagine how weak someone would be by the time that they've been, their beards chirped out, they're, sp they're spitting their face, um, they've been beaten, they've been, they've been hit in the face. Just imagine, like, after that, being called to go take your cross up to Golgotha. There's no wonder there had to be a, a Simon the Syrian came, came along and carried, carried the cross for him. Um, and from there, like, the, the willingness just to lay himself out. I don't know, they had a, a squad of Roman soldiers around there. Um, that was probably usual, just to have a battle, you might say. Like, at the end, this guy would try to get away just, just to avoid the cross, but Jesus just went on it. Like, and they, they chose spots in his hands that, that wouldn't, um, if I thought this through right, it's, it's quite likely that they, they chose spots in his hand um, and his feet that um, the, the larger arteries, if I understand them right, would be like further back on your limbs, further up on your leg, or further in on your arms. Um, but they, they chose the places that the nerves um, narrow down, they go to some very fine places like we feel with our hands. There's lots of nerves going right up through our arms into our fingertips because we so, we so much use those to, to know what we got, like what we feel and what we have around us. And we don't think about it, but if, if you just pull up a graph on, on the internet to find where nerves, they, they really narrow through their wrist. And I, I think that's, that's exactly where they drove that nail through. Um, that's where they... <laughs> It's, it, made, it made the criminal, it made the, the person, the victim, to, to have pain, like an agonizing amount of pain, but, uh, but not just a lot of blood loss. And so, so this would go on and on as a, as a torture and a punishment for the victim. Um, and, and that's what, that's what he um, went through. Um, and... You know, on, once he was on the cross, it's it's a pretty uh, pretty heart jerking you know, reality of how, how that all went down. But he he was saying, "Father, forgive them. They know not what they do." And there's just something so great about that. There's, there's something so profound about about having such such a um, ability. Like, where does power come from to enable a body to do that? I have this cut on my finger. It bothers me. I work with it. It's like right there. It just, it hurts. What if that, that was intensified a thousand times by my enemy? What would I say? Father, forgive him. That's what Jesus said. He was on the cross. Um... I have to kind of imagine some things as I read the accounts, but, but just something like being on that cross. Um, the, the guy that came around to break the legs is 
that's the account in John. Um, I think the other Gospels might not say that, but, but he didn't break the legs of Jesus because he was dead already. Um, and I don't, I don't know for sure. I, I expect that um, some of the things Jesus said wasn't just said to the disciples. People, people understood that this man says that he's going to be used like this and he's going to raise, raise up from the dead. They perceived him as dead, but they still stuck the spear in his side. It, the only uh, way it makes sense is to, for fulfillment of prophecy, and also just like in a human thinking way of thinking, that perhaps, perhaps that was a way that they thought um, it's not as likely as he'll fulfill his own words <clears throat> if they put a spear in his sight. Anyhow, that's that's how that went. Um, And that's how he uh, that's how he brought way the way the way of the way of Jesus was was a victorious way that you know it's just described all all the way through his through his gospels that through this um, laying down your one's own life taking up the cross um, that's that's how true life is gained. And it's, it's a foolishness to the world. You know, the world seeks after the wisdom of man. And, and, um, and they, don't, they don't find this at all an option to find, to find life. Life for the world, an unconverted person, is, is to, um, to subdue the other, like, like in competition, to like put down the one that that's um, beside him, or the one that's along, alongside him. But but Jesus, he calls us to a, a greater, a greater way. Jesus truly lived and taught us um, how to resist an evil person, how, how to not resist an evil person. I'm going to read that account in uh, Luke six. But I say to you which hear, love your enemy, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, pray for them which despitefully use you. And on him that smites thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. Him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to everyone that asks of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of which you have hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. You shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Do we believe? Do we, do we believe that all these things work together for, for the good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose? Um, is this something that, I think it's something that. <clears throat> And we have to have it fixed in our hearts because it's not so much um, that we're called by the government and by religious people and we're tried in this way um, like Jesus was and similarly like some of the apostles were. We're not, we're not quite in that setting. The message is still the same though because a lot of these things start so much in the heart. Um, the government is still... Um, even though it's giving the, these liberties and freedoms for us to exercise what we believe, um, they would still have that potential. It is still very necessary that we predetermine what we would do. And then most important, just that there are some actual, some actual ways to um, like, know that we have an enemy in our soul. It's, it's so much... <laughs> What, what stands out to me in these verses, the, the four verses from the Gospels about 
uh, well, three of the Gospels would say, for, for what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world but lose his own soul? It's so much about the soul, the very thing that transfers to heaven or, or to hell. It's, that's the thing that, that we need to... Uh, I mean, that's the thing that God loves. That's the very thing that, uh, that I'm hearing coming from these verses that, that matter the most. It's not so much, you know, whether we get to live uh, off the chart, you know, in length of days, or whether we are six or seven years old. It's, it's, that's not so much the important part. The, the part is like, um, we have a soul. Like the moment we're born, it's just, there's a soul within us. And that soul should should be following after, should be following hard after him. The way of the cross shows mercy. In James it says, you have killed the just one and he did not resist. It's just, I'm not sure exactly where that is, but somewhere um, says that. Do we believe that to live is Christ and to die is gain? If we are truly saved, how can we defend ourselves and try to save our life? I think it's just a good, good question. Like, if we did have to defend our lives through, you know, physical means and so on, it. It's already putting it on display, like that, that we're life, our life is not saved, you know, that we're not saved. And then, and then, just off in our minds, we uh, try to categorize, or it can be so easy and possible to uh, make a list of enemies, uh, or a list of. Oh, I want to be careful how I say that, but just not that. Um, not that I think in a brotherhood there should be enemies, but, but just still that there are ways that we can um, bless those, that, that maybe they do some things that aren't so, uh, we don't quite understand or we, don't, we wish it'd be different. Um, I'm not talking about sin issues, I'm just talking about things that, um, that are uh, <clears throat> of preference maybe. Um, are we are we able to um, have the same exercise towards towards that the same kind of mercy that we that we would have if we would be actually faced with an with an enemy that's that's against our flesh? The only only reason I bring that up is just I th I find myself um, having a harder battle. Just seems like I have already committed that that if there was. A government coming by and they would they would want to take me by force that that wouldn't be the hardest thing for me to to lay down my life but but like what about laying down our lives for the brothers I want to find that passage um, oh maybe like what what it says in Hebrews about Moses that Moses um, I have to find that he did it with the people He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So, so that brings kind of out how um, corporate suffering, I would, I would call it corporate suffering. Let's join, like the encouragement to join hands with the suffering and the affliction of God's people. Um, rather than like, I got my little battle, you got your little battle, we're kind of thinking we're against each other. Let's, let's have an understanding that it's, it's corporate. Corporate goal, corporate suffering, um, and, and a back and forth that, that I th that's what I think Moses was willing to do rather than enjoying the, sins of the, the pleasure of sins. Um, I have a few more things in Luke 12 that I think are important, and then I want to move <clears throat> to some other verses. Mm. 
Mm, let me see. Luke 12, verse 13 says, And one of the company said to him, Master, speak to my brother that he, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who hath made me a judge or a divider over you? That's Jesus saying that. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not of the abundance of things which he possesses. Um, and then it goes... All right, I wanted to stop there and... Um, just picture this scenario a bit. Jesus was not the type of, uh, he was not promoting the same kind of overcoming that the courts were promoting. In, in the courts, there was, there was brothers could call each other in and, and still do. Um, call each other in and then, and, you know, whoever has the best case for his whatever, like he, he gets to be called the victor, or he gets to he gets to do the goods. Um, Jesus just said he's he's not of that. Like he uh, he's not a he's not a um, judge or a divider of those things. And and he didn't give much explanation. That's what I like about Jesus' teaching. Is sometimes he just leaves with it without explanation. But this is what he does. He says, "Take heed." Beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not of the abundance of things which he possesses. And then he finishes saying why he's not a judge and a divider by giving a parable. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a rich man brought forth forth plenty. And he thought within himself, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take heed, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So it is. So is he that layeth up treasures for him ha- himself and is not rich towards God. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have store, house, or barn. God feeds them. How much more are ye better than fowls? Which of you, with, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take thought for the rest? And he goes on. I'm just going to stop there. That's all in context of that man's question, dividing the goods. And there's just a, a good message in there concerning, um, yeah, I, I expect that guy had the choice of walking away with his, with his goods, going to some other master, asking him to divide the goods, or he could just simply submit and be like, yeah, you know what, I can, I can, I can just become, you know, a part of part of him by by offering my second coat to this guy like this guy might have been asking him some basics like no I, I want this give it to me and Jesus had already covered all that like if someone asked your coat give him your cloak also um, and life just isn't much different for us like we we come to these places circumstances in life and we can choose one or the other we can do, choose life through doing things the way Jesus said, or the other option is just death. Um, but, but in doing things the way Jesus <coughs> says, there's just always an overcoming. Revelations explains that. like There was a war, the beast and the dragon, they made war against, they made war against the lamb and her offspring. But um, it just clearly says that that he they overcame. 
Revelation 17. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords, the King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. That's the hope part of, of what I'm trying to, to say. Then I want to go to Hebrews verse Hebrews 5 has some really interesting verses about all that. Verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was hurt in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learnt he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Taking up the cross is a matter of obedience and submission. And, I mean, the hope... The hope is just eternal life. The hope is to be re resurrected into a new, into a new man, and it it requires that that new birth. I like to think of it that a man my age can't can't get much. I mean, I can eat all the proteins I want. I won't grow much more. Just you can't grow once you're grown. You have to you have to die like a a corn of wheat has to die, and unless it does, it just just won't, won't grow. So it takes that little seed dying and then from there becomes the, the new birth and the great uh, working of God in the new man. Um, of which Jesus even displays that like Jesus himself was a little child at one time. And um, in Luke, Luke chapter 2 it says that he, he was subject to his parents. It was it's just kind of a display of where they were traveling, and they went from here to there. And it says that Jesus followed them, and he was subject to them. He was subject to them. It just seemed like he already, at a very young age, just had that in him, that wisdom and that, um, that understanding, that power of God. The, this gospel message, it liberates us um, and it, it gives us, uh, if we kind of follow on into, oh, like what the apostles had to say about these things, we can, we can think a little bit about um, Timothy where it talks about um, that we're to be, we're be, the sub, we're to be subject to the rulers, the governors of the land, and then Romans 13, it says the same things, that they are rewarders of those that do good and those that do, do bad. Um, and there's just, there are things to be subject to them um, as long as it doesn't cross over into where we need to compromise. Um, and, and like the gospel didn't come to liberate us from, from servanthood. It, it came to enable us to servant, servanthood. It came to enable us to be a slave and a servant to, to Christ and to those around us. Um, I think a big part of the evangelical gospel preaches um, like an individualistic, selfish, find who you are, put it on display, and just forget about roles. Just forget about there being any kind of a role. Um, and that's not at all what I, <clears throat> what I hear that the gospel does. Like it, it enables us to, um, to um, truly show mercy. It enables us to truly um, think of the other more, more highly than ourselves and, and to have a true servant heart. And with that, I want to read um, first, Peter, first Peter, I guess it would be 2, over into 3. <clears throat> Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Uh, we, we find that for the Lord's sake, the apostles say that. 
Um, and I think it, it just kind of puts it out there like, we're not just doing it just somehow because, oh, it's the best thing for us, or it's just, you know, the, um, life goes better if, it's, if we submit and we do it grudgingly. No, we're doing it for the Lord. We submit to the ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to kings as supreme or to governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. That's, that's my verse. But I think there is another verse in Timothy. <clears throat> it talks about the same thing. <clears throat> and so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Get that? Like just by well-doing, honorable things, um, things that are profound and noticeably um, good, we can put to silence the, the ign <coughs> ignorance of foolish men. I wonder how often I just see, maybe especially like in a husband and wife, that they just can't work out their differences. And so often you can just step back and see that both of them aren't willing to do any of this. They're both in error in that they're not uh, trying to silence the other with, with just good things. Um, and, 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 I th and I do think that Christ did that and he asked us to do the same. We'll get to Philippians yet. That, uh, there's a good message in there about all that. <clears throat> as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Maliciousness would have, oh, just like having liberty, but but only having it with an evil intent. Like knowing that we, that we are liberated. Um, I mean, didn't Paul say somewhere that if we have the chance to be free, we can be free. But but he meant, I think Paul meant that, like if a, if a servant or a slave has, has the chance to be free, they can be, be free, but it ought to be for the sake of <coughs> the sake of the gospel, not just for some evil intent. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy. If a man for, the, for, for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Yeah, this is, this is the same Peter that we've talked about and found the gospel that found it so hard when Jesus was talking to him about suffering and that he's going to be suffering many things and, and be put on trial and scorched and whipped and so on. He, he seems to have a good grip on it now. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? That can be for children, that can be for adults. There's no glory in suffering for our faults. We make faults and we can just, there's just what we, what we sow is what we're going to reap. That's just a, a law of life. And... We should avoid as much of that as we can. There's no glory in it. But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who in his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should not live unto righteous, should live unto righteous unto the righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. It's, it's like he is he's the one that, that went ahead. He was the first of those um, to do it in the body. And he went ahead with example, and um, he was the first to, to go ahead, and he bore our sins, and that way he bore our sins, 
in his body on the tree. Um, but, but these sins aren't born. He did not bear our sins on a tree if we don't confess them. Like he, if we, we're still dead in our sins if we don't confess them. Um, but, but if someone's confessing them, then like it says in uh, Romans, that, that, he, that is, he that is dead is freed from sin. Um, it's just, just how it is. Like a, a dead man is like that has lost his life, has given his life, has has uh, come to the cost, has given all that, given all that up. Um, <coughs> such a such a death is free from sin. Sin has no, you know, not that you want to, but if it was surrounded with temptation, it'd just be dead to it. Like, does this the dead flesh that? Ones was crucified, and um, and now it doesn't get enticed anymore by sin and its pleasure. It's a bad testimony if we hear of people that that and and <clears throat> um, just have a a story that you know my spouse just torments me when she's around. She knows how to push the buttons. That's a terrible testimony. We should be way above that as Christians. It shouldn't be named amongst us that, that our spouse just aggravates us, just knows how to aggravate us, and knows how to, um, how to even bring it to the point that, that there's, there's a divorce. That's terrible. That's a terrible testimony. Um, such a one doesn't, doesn't know the power of God. And, and the, the saving cross way of doing things. When he was threatened, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges right, righteously. Um, yeah, time is moving on. I want to Move on. We're called to to submit to ser to masters. We're called to submit to the governments. Um, and it, it says as unto the Lord, like you know. So there's just that clause of like submission, but the ultimate submission is to the Lord. <clears throat> Could have some water. A saying I found or. I found it in my notes here somewhere. We're either dead in sin or we're dead to sin. And that's, thank you, that's my verse about for he that is dead is free from sin, Romans 6, 7. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we'll get to some closing verses in Colossians. Colossians 13 talks about a putting on and a putting off. Uh, verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy, beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, meekness of mind, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perf perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. For whatsoever ye do in word, or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Yeah. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 1. Just a couple words. 
2 Thessalonians. Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, <clears throat> so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest taken, token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. So, it's unknown to me like what kind of suffering this was, but it does seem like this would have been, takes me to thinking it's the, the corporate suffering one, one with another in a brotherhood. Because it's, it's making the appeal to the brethren um, because your faith grows exceeding and the charity of every one of you abounds towards each other. And, and I, I just want to emphasize that kind of, um, that kind of suffering. Like we need to be long-suffering one towards another and have, have that mind of Christ in us and just, just know that um, good things that we receive of one another, they, they usually come with also there being hard and difficult things. That would include suffering, like we have to suffer with one another in a, in a lot of ways. But we never should suffer compromise or suffer or put up with uh, sin in any way. Um, when I get to Philippians, some similar things. <clears throat> Philippians 1, verse 27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing terrified by your adversary, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in, in me. So, so this, what I get from this is uh, another corporate setting of uh, suffering for the sake of Jesus. Um, and, it, and I might point out just not only in believing in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's what, what verse 29 says. Um, and it's just, that's how I find it is um, believing that he is, and that where he comes from, and that, you know, all those things are, are half their part, but um, they need to go hand in hand with, with suffering. It might be saved, like, like James points out, the importance of faith coupled with works brings glory to God. And so believing coupled with suffering brings glory to God is what I can get out of this. But if someone, someone separates them or someone's willing only to believe but not, but he's still kind of ashamed, like back to the original message of, of what Jesus said about he that is... Um, Ashamed of me and my words in that day, I will be ashamed of them as well. Um, that's all in the context of losing your life for his sake. Um, yeah, there's just um, a real hope of glory in, in this if we have the mind of Christ. You know, the, the man, um, and I trust we have that like within us, we... With the mind of Christ, we, we see this as a hopeful thing because, like Brother Dito was pointing out, life is temporal. It's, it's, we're mortals. Um, he didn't say that, but 
it's very very temporal here, and we're we have our hope set on something greater, right? Like we're we're not just left here, and you know that's the end of it. We have a hope of eternal life, and um, this life here just more or less proves, you know, whether we're going to be found worthy. Again, like it like some of the things that Jesus said we are to do so that we're found worthy of him on that day. Um, another thing concerning Jesus is in Philippians chapter 2. This is Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being fashioned, found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, I really appreciate that, that song this morning about um, help me Lord hmm, how is it again toil. toil and trouble meeting yeah when they come together heir to save me as a father's hand one by one days and moments fleeting till we reach the, the father's promised land and that's that's the hope we have I just want to encourage everyone that way and um, leave it at that and God bless you all and hope to hear some comments and corrections if necessary God bless you yeah I appreciated uh, <clears throat> both uh, lessons the opening and uh, the uh, main message um, I think um, that verse in Psalms 90 that says, Lord, we sang the song then, says, uh, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. And I just, I just think that, uh, <clears throat> that that was, that that's good. And it's good for us to, to think about our days, think about the length of our time here and how it's short, it's fleeting, and that can help us to, to apply our hearts to wisdom. Uh, <clears throat> and a few thoughts. Uh, one was uh, um, regarding what uh, Brother Adley shared about how Jesus responded with the uh, Father, forgive them. And the, just the challenge of uh, uh, how do we how do we respond? Uh, maybe even when when we we feel like we're being treated uh, wrongly, um, even to a much lesser degree. Um, I had to think about the account in Luke. Nine, where uh, Jesus was going through Samaria towards uh, Jerusalem and, he, and they stopped in at a village of the Samaritans and they didn't receive him because they perceived that he was going to Jerusalem and then when James and John saw this they said Lord do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did and he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, they thought they were just following maybe the example of a, of a prophet and a man of God in the Old Testament in their desire to call down fire to destroy these people who had offended them by not receiving them. And Jesus told them that you don't know what spirit you're of. So I do think that that, that, uh, 
a desire to, to destroy our enemies or to want to see our enemies destroyed is not, um, is not the spirit of Christ. Um, I, had, I, I went back and looked at the account there in uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 that I think if they were referencing it was when uh, um, uh, the king Ahaziah had sent out the captain of 50 to, to tell, to bring in Elijah and then Elijah had answered the first and second captain that if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And then the, the, when the third captain came out, instead of just calling up to him where he was, that captain came up and uh, um, pleaded with Elijah to, uh, um, what does it say? He said, let, let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Um, and then it says, an angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him, do not be afraid of him. And so he went with him, and I just, I just had to wonder there, um, like, it's, it's remarkable that fire came down from heaven and consumed the, the, the 50, but, but whether or not that was, um, but, but, but having that, spirit or that attitude to want to call down uh, fire from heaven is not necessarily a remarkable thing. It would be a very common thing, a thing that uh, would not necessarily be a, um, something that would, would, would mark someone as having the spirit of, of God or specifically, more specifically, maybe the spirit of Christ. Um, and then the other thought I had was about uh, uh, the going the extra mile. This may be kind of a, uh, I just had this thought, it never really occurred to me, that uh, Jesus was telling them uh, that if, if someone com compelled them to go a mile to go with them too, so uh, and this, I think, now I don't remember, do we just know that this was uh, the Roman military? Like the soldiers who would, were, would, would do this, or does it actually say that in the text? But my understanding is that the Roman uh, soldiers could, could compel them to carry their stuff or to go with them and carry their stuff. Uh, and then Jesus encouraged them to go to I just thought about like does that uh, is that something to consider in like in the, I've just had this discussion with people about like whether uh, I guess in a sense they were conscripted like for for service in the Roman military and Jesus told them not only to to comply but to, to walk with them an extra mile so I just know that among People who are COs, there's there's been there's like a debate of whether whether it's okay to do like non non like nonviolent military service or whether that's participating in in something that's that's wrong. Anyway, I just had to. I don't know if that's relevant to to consider or not. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you, Brother Adley, and uh, I appreciate your graphic description of the Lord on, <clears throat> on the cross and go on and on. I know a lot of groups, they, I guess from your background and others, many Mennonites, uh, when Easter comes, Passover, the, the preacher will make a four or five hour passion description of it, and I hope that shot when we take communion again we can remember that it's just for a few minutes to think of remember the you know, the death on there and uh, the description most people well i guess i'm a little different i i can't stand the sight of blood when i see it there on the road and uh all the blood is splattered i just 
have to look the other way. I'm, I wouldn't be a good doctor or nurse because blood makes me crazy looking at it, but uh, that's the, uh, <laughs> without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, and I appreciate how you read First Peter, that uh, the <laughs> valuable blood of Christ. You know, on death, someone said this once, that death today, like the body that goes into the casket and stuff, it's been sanitized. Back then, the body would decay, it would look terrible, it would be really gross. But now, the body's in the casket now, they look, with all the makeup and cosmetics, they look better. <laughs> they look better in the casket than they did in real life, which is sad. But that's the, the sanitizing of... People don't want to think of death, and they want to brush it from their minds and the way they, they look. It's all, you know, my brother, uh, I don't know if you, you know, all flesh is grass. Well, you know, it's the, the foul afraids and the, the things in our time, but everyone's concerned about how they look now. And uh, he, last night at the howdy days there, I mean, the immodesty was so great. Everyone, there's no imagination of the immodesty. It's, so great. it's the flash. And all flesh is grass, and it withers, and it's praise the Lord for the modesty of your sisters, and it's going to get a reap a reward. It's going to reap a reward. But anyway, on that death thing, I know uh, Michael, <coughs> Brother Michael Ostrom likes to say that blood is red because it's danger. When you see it, it's danger. It startles you. That's why blood, God made it the color red, and uh, I'm, I'm just weak for that. And one last point, when it, they, were, they were experts at crucifying, and I appreciate it when... <coughs> Well, Al was up there and he said, uh, can I have a, uh, a drink of water? So Sister Barbara went up and gave him a thing. One of Jesus' last statements on the cross was, <clears throat> I thirst. They knew how to tur torture you so much that you're on there for, what, I think he was on there for six hours, and yet he still had not only his nerve endings, but his mind. I, I, I thirst. I mean, they, they knew how, to, they knew how to, you still have your faculties. And, uh, you know, Al was thirsted just for... Speaking, but imagine being on the cross with your arms stretched out and, and and all the shame. The Lord be magnified. I love these uh, messages. They're really uh, causing me to think. I hope it's causing all of us to think. Um, I, I love how he says that. By the way, the Lord be magnified. Uh, glory to the Lord. And uh, that's kind of what I think about when. Uh, uh, I hear uh, there's something that was revealed to me through a brother, uh, I believe it's the Holy Spirit. It's, you know how the Holy Spirit will just kind of unlock things in Scripture to you. and just uh, When it says uh, to hate your... Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> to, uh, to hate your, your own life unto death or to... If, you're not, if you don't hate your own life, you're not worthy to be his disciple. Uh, that word, I never really realized, like in the Greek it says suke. So it's spirit. Soul. Soul, yeah. right. Uh, soul? Okay. Yeah. And so I, I started to think about that. Um, in that context. So like, I started to think, what is the spirit or the soul of, of Luke? You know, like, what, what, is, what do I want versus what God wants? Um, and I think, well, in a situation where you're being persecuted or something happens, uh, or you could be in a situation where you have to choose Christ over whatever the, the situation is, um, you're faced with a decision whether you, are you going to choose the, are you going to choose yourself or are you going to choose what God wants. Um, so I started thinking about that more, and before that, I didn't really think about what that meant. Um, so I just wanted to share that because, uh, like, I feel that persecution is going to become something that's that's really going to get a lot worse. It's going to start. It's already happening in America. People see it in certain places. If you seek after it, you can see it. It can, um, but it's going to get worse. Um, so I really think that all of it comes down to, I think that all of us should think about uh, the parable of the sower when it comes down to that. 
the same the seed which is the word of God is planted on a different type of ground like so we have to think about are, are we going to are we going to buckle like uh, Peter did when the wind came and things got uh, you know chaotic or are we going to listen to God's words will we really believe that we can walk all the way on the water to him and I just think that whenever we leave the church, we go back into our life. Uh, will we really? It's all a test for all of us, obviously, to to ask ourselves: Do we really hate our life? Do we really hate our own spirit? Like 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 your brother was saying earlier, talking about. Uh, I was just mentioning how our own, I don't know, it's just like how, how our own life just gets in the way. Uh, I just, uh, as a, right, right now I'm in a strange situation myself with my, with my job and you tend to get into the flesh when things happen to you, you don't know everything what's what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, honestly, think right now they're trying to push me out of my job. Uh, it's it's a, it's a weird situation for me. I don't want to talk about all that stuff. It's just like whatever our situation is. It's just key, you know. Obviously, to to look to God and not get in the flesh and just. Uh, as a brother said, uh, the Lord be magnified always, you know, and us be brought down. Yeah. So praise God. Oh,
Teach me to number 